My name is Silvio Pupo. This is Roberto Romay and Victor Romero. Uh, Lorenzo Del Zopo. And um, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, identity management and blockchain. Uh, we have a couple of special guests. Uh, I see that uh, you already had um, this wonderful gentleman tell you a little bit about his technology and what he's working on. We also have Alessandro Chiarini in the back. Say hi, Alessandro. Good. Alessandro is the CEO of, uh, of Fortress. Uh, Fortress is a biometric and uh, voice recognition company that uh, is being applied for cybersecurity or any security protocol uh, across different industries. Um, so we have a couple of experts that are actually doing real uh, applications in terms of um, identity management. There's another company that I sit on the board of called Digital Town. Uh, Digital Town just did a hackathon there in Austin, also rolling out here in Miami to do a Miami coin. And Digital Town uh, had a hackathon on identity management that they won and uh, was, a, was essentially a, figuring out how they could help people living in the street that always lose their documents and don't, didn't have anything, uh, come up with a, a, a solution that would allow them to access their benefits, their social security, their healthcare, their records, so on and so forth. And it's really just a simple QR code. Um, so, uh, I think Who are we? Who are we? We're the Government Blockchain Association. The Government Blockchain Association is, uh, we're about 100 chapters strong all over the world. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, uh, paid for by members, so uh, thank you, and uh, please consider joining our organization. Uh, we have a series of experts all over the world, across different segments, uh, called working groups, uh, as well as uh, groups of special interest, uh, which includes some academia, universities, uh, amongst others. Uh, just as a, uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, I know that you guys get a chance to interchange and trade notes and, and meet each other. Uh, usually we do that as, as one of the, you know, the formalities of understanding who we have in the room. Uh, how many people here, just to get a, uh, get a feel, uh, have been in, have, have already maybe invested or looked at investments into cryptocurrency? Yeah, I lost a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, so, how That's many, a joke, I made a lot of them. Good, good. Uh, you're, you're, you're good. The guy sitting next to you has actually had a really good success story too. Yeah. yeah and uh, well, how many people um, have uh, uh, already feel like they have a baseline understanding of blockchain? Everybody. Wonderful. Ooh. Awesome. Miami is more and more leading in blockchain technology, uh, and I think that really this offers an opportunity for Miami to distinguish itself as the as a sort of like you know teenager that's discovering identity as, uh, as our way of being able to identify. Uh, and we want to be able to merge the public sector and the private sector and build people around the table uh, to exchange ideas really and then come up with solutions that we can tackle together, just like the working groups are doing uh, in DC and around the world. Uh, right now we're, um, we're, look, we're, we're looking at doing consortiums with municipalities and we'd like to, uh, we encourage you to, uh, after this, uh, approach us and find out a little bit more about our membership organization how you can get involved every month at the end of the month or uh, every other month we're doing a blockchain 101 course. We're doing a certification. Uh, the certification is a global certification um, and uh, we'll, we'll give you access to, if you become a member you can go onto our portal, you can access all the other resources that we have online. There's lots and lots and lots of resources online. Uh, GBA Global has spent a lot of time and money to build out these resources to give it to all the members that join. Uh, but not just that, at the local level, we want to make great working groups. So, anybody here in healthcare? Anyone here in cybersecurity? Anyone here in government? Anyone here in transportation? <laughs> Anyone here in telecom? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone here in finance? In the Anyone here in finance? Alessandro, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, within all these working groups, right? Anyone the programmer? Any programmers in the room? Okay, we have our programmers. Uh, so what we want to do is have these dynamic uh, experts at a local level, at a hyper-local level, I should say. Um, so when we come across challenges, or City of Miami, or City of Coral Gables, or Miami-Dade County, or, or Fort Lauderdale, et cetera, comes up with a problem, we have our own experts, just like we have at a global level, that the ex our local experts say, you're you know, in finance and you get involved with the banking uh, working group, right? So you're able to download and upload all the, all, the, all the information that we need constantly to be up to date on what the latest and the greatest is, so when we have an obstacle, you're able to execute on a local level. Right? And so that's where we're operating. So corporate members could also join and then take advantage of contract opportunities. So anyway, I won't mention more. Uh, I think that's enough for GBA Global, uh, GBS. That's what we're doing. 
Uh, Lorenzo is a compliance attorney and, and very active in the blockchain space. He's launched his own companies. Uh, we're entrepreneurial. He has a couple of, of startups that he's working on. Uh, he's launched uh, uh, his, his ICO as well. Yep. Uh, so we have a lot of, I think, experience in the room. And uh, anyway, that's that for that. So without further ado, I'm not going to hold you guys anymore. I'd like uh, for our guests to be able to talk a little bit about their use cases and what they're doing in identity management. And just as a primer, we're going to go over what where the industry is and what we have to present to you. Then we'll open up the floor for everybody. It's an open format. You know, we'll give uh, maybe 15, 15, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, so you guys can talk about what you're doing. And then it'll be open format for you, for us to be able to brainstorm or, or bring anything up. Does that sound okay? All right, so uh, is there any takeaway that anybody has, particularly from today, that you'd like to accomplish? Any particular takeaways? Take okay, well, Renzo, do you want to give a presentation? Yes, uh, another point, uh, today the presentation, the, the original topic uh, was identity management on the blockchain, that's uh, the introduction. As he said, the way that, uh, our format we are not here to lecture anybody the whole plan is to have animated conversation like uh, in an italian way <laughs> i don't know <laughs> I just like that picture in general uh, and so uh, tonight as i said it's kind of a joint event between the identity management and blockchain technology and uh, ai and blockchain it is a, the other topic that will be uh, touched in private. We'll be here and we're going to talk a little bit more on, uh, on that specific subject. I'm going to start to introduce the identity management because this is probably like the most important thing. In my opinion, in my opinion, this will be the future of blockchain. Absolutely. Like they're, 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 this is going to, our identity will be on the blockchain. There are no doubt about that. And why uh, I have no doubt? Because uh, it's incredibly convenient it's, uh, and it's immutable. The blockchain is immutable. And the things that you, there are only two things that <laughs> you want that are immutable. Like your identity and what you own, your asset. So those are the two main things. That's why, in my opinion, the future is identity management and real estate. The financing part, all that funny stuff about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the finance is just a tool. This is something that is, uh, that yes, it will have a great implication, and it will always be there for the transaction. But the core, the core part that will tie to that that everything will tie to that will be like the physical assets that are immutable. In this case, like identity and, and real estate. Real estate is another topic. So anyway, we are not going to talk about that. The <coughs> we want to touch it from a particular point of view. Okay? The, the point of view is, uh, it's, uh, as I said, what we are doing here, we are very focused on social empathy. And one of the biggest issues with, uh, with the identity is that a big, big chunk of the worldwide population has issues with their own identity. Like for us, it's simple. Like we, we, we are used, we, we have an issue, we, uh, we walk uh, in, um, with our identity, we walk uh, in a driver license office uh, or uh, passport agencies. And we can get all the information that we want from there. Well, but that's not a, a reality for a lot of people. Let's just remember all the discussion that we had about the voting rights and what kind of IDs that had to be presented even to register for voting here in the US, first world country. Okay, let's try to transmit that and thinking about in a different context in something like a way wider, like in a third world country. Those for that, that particular implication, it, it, it's huge. It's huge because you, you can may have, imagine if you were born in the favelas of Brazil, okay? You were in the favela, favela do Brazil, Arrocinha, that is near Rio de Janeiro. I've been there, it's pretty cool. There's some, like, no bear, nobody else. And in, but in that area, you have people that, lots of them, they don't even, they were not even born in a hospital. 
Okay, they were born inside the favela, they grew up in the favela, they do not have registration, nobody knows who they are. In fact, there are so-called meninos de rua that are these kids that they can assault you, like when you walk, stop at the traffic light. Okay, and these are they fall under this particular group. It looks like there are a big chunk of our population, worldwide population, two billions, that they have issues with uh, with with verify their own idea, who they are. But uh, think about also certain areas uh, of uh, places in the Middle East, or if you think about like uh, areas that are very tribal, like uh, even in uh, in Africa, that they they never really had like a real record record of who they of who they were. So this this is like it's. It's something that is there, it's very uh, visible, and it became particularly visible with the issues of the refugee crisis. That was in the news, everybody heard about that, and there was people who didn't like them, but let's remember, these are people that they were, they received, their house was bombed, their country was bombed, they got stripped out of all their assets, they were run away, and they cross border in a way that was not very legal sometimes. Okay, these people, they are, they, it's very difficult for them to prove uh, who, they, who they actually are. And this is, oh, okay. I can't say, okay. And this, this is what, okay. this is what we are used to. We are used to uh, the, our ID is represented in various levels. Uh, we can have data of our, like, uh, our social security number. We can have data related to our bank account, our financial transaction, our marriage. All, all these pieces of data that when we think about the ID, we always think about like just, just like first thing that comes out is your, your, your driver license that you always have with you. Well, this is just a piece. There are a lot of things that are attached to all this. Like that who you are is just the first step. Think about when you open an account uh, in a bank, you walk into a bank and they ask you, uh, they know your customer policy, you know, they, they, the so-called KYC, they ask you who you are and I need to verify who you actually are. Okay, that's only the first step, why? Because on top of that, you attach a million of others. That is like even gets your biometric information. The great advantage with the, with the, with the blockchain is the fact that all those pieces of information can be stored in a safe place. And currently, there are some guidelines, and this is where it comes out, uh, uh, like the, our position, you know. We are the Government Blockchain Association, we are, uh, we try to foster relationship in between public and private, and that's why it's so relevant, uh, the ID, uh, the, the digital, the, uh, the I, identity, uh, the ID <laughs> management <laughs> for us, because the government has a strong interest in this. The interest, as I said, can be at the voting rights, but also driver license, uh, and uh, if you think about, you know, a property titles uh, and all these they attach. And that's why they issue their own specific protocols. So there are actually protocols that we are issued um, re uh, re uh, recently, because nowadays all this data is going is, is going in some sort of database, electronic uh, database, and this electronic database has certain kind of requirement, particularly related to safety. Lorenzo, do you know talking about the retina scan and, and the law? Can you go back there? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the, you guys know the refugee crisis that's happening, obviously, between Africa, people trying to go over to Greece, and everybody waiting there. There is a, there is a, a, a solution that the UN came up with, which is a retina scan to be able to uh, allocate, you know, 
your portion of you know, towels, soap, water, and a, and a tent, for example. Right? And they're just using, your, they're basically, because people are coming with the documents, taking your, your, your ID from your retina and using that as your fingerprint um, to, to do it. Is there any guideline for that? Do you know, do you know the project, Lorenzo? Do you know? Yes, yeah. I, I know about the project, but this, is, this was a test. The biggest issue in reality is where the data is stored and who is actually managing the data. Because the problem with this data, you, you're a refugee, you don't really want your identity to be accessed by other people. Right. That's the biggest problem. The advantage of the blockchain is who can access that? Only the individual. The, that particular individual is the one that has access to the data. So those, there are some, we are at the level of testing still. We have certain areas of the world, like uh, in Estonia, they create uh, uh, digital citizenship. Uh, uh, for instance, a certain area of the world that they are trying to push in, in this direction, but it hasn't been like fully achieved uh, yet. Well, blockchain. Why, that's the, the, the whole point is like, why blockchain intersects so well uh, with, the, uh, with the identity management part? Because the best part, my opinion, eh? like as I said, this is an open floor. The best, of, the best is this. Think about uh, Haiti. Think about what happened in a place like Haiti that suddenly get hit by everything. Because uh, Haiti got hit by everything. Uh, it can be uh, it can be a hurricane. Uh, it can be like a earthquake, a tsunami. Something happens there all the time. So, they big big problem there where that was in fact where the data was stored. That the data was stored there in the country, and a lot of those data was wiped out. And one of the cases were like. A, there is a specific case that was related to real estate property, and a lot of people like start claiming certain assets that instead were owned by other people. But since there was this, a lot of government building got destroyed, there were server there where the data was stored, got lost. Great advantage of blockchain: it's not the server is not in one place; it's everywhere. It can be anywhere in the world. Everybody share this data that actually is encrypted. So. From a disaster recovery standpoint, it's a great, great tool. And this is probably the, one of the best things about that, uh, about uh, the, the blockchain. Then, of course, it's permission, it's secure, because all the data is encrypted, only the person that, that, that we, only the individual can access that. It's, it's, there are a bunch of computer in between, and that, like there is the community that practically protect the, the, the uh, security of the information. Like, if there is some, some hacker, somebody that tried to oh, uh, artificially modify those data, there is like the community that protects the data instead of like uh, some centralized form uh, like uh, a firewall or whatever. How the blockchain work? You said that you're familiar with the blockchain. Uh, everybody already yeah. heard about uh, a lot about that, so I'm going to skip that because it's so boring. I heard it a million times. Go ahead. Uh, have you heard of the um, vending machine that Civic made during consensus this year? Which one? Is it? Beers? The uh, consensus this year, Civic, they're, they're an identity platform. Uh, right. Civic. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. I love so those guys. They, they, um, they made a vending machine at consensus that was able to anonymously prove that you were over 21 and then give you a beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's a, it's the perfect example right. of why we need that. And you need that because but you can't get your ID to a machine. Yeah, but the, the great part is when you walk into a store, let's, let's say I go to Publix and uh, I, I, I want to purchase some alcohol. You know? And I have to, they ask you for your ID. I don't really want to show them where is my address, right. uh, who am I even, why they have to know my name. You know, I do not want those kind of information to be shared with whoever this person. The only thing, I don't even want them to know my date of birth. The only thing that they need to know is if I'm older than that, period. This is the greatest part, like the sharing of the data, of the information uh, with the people.
So I, I like your example. That is, is that is article about if you Google. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah, so and uh, and Civica has a huge community, and they are doing a lot of relationship. And what my project, by the way, also have relationship. Uh, so it's uh, the the other part that is very when we talk about the important part and everybody which is it's it's why it's so also relevant is also because of the variety of information that can pile up and can be added in the same place where it's stored this identity. You are not, you do not have to think about it your identity as only your basic form of data, you also have to think about everything that is attached to that, like your military record, medical record for healthcare purposes, all this kind of information for security purposes they could be stored on the, on the blockchain. Uh, governance. The gov there are a bunch of projects here in Florida, Bill 1357, uh, issued by, sponsored by uh, Senator James Grant uh, in January. Uh, they had, they wanted to put our Florida driver license on the blockchain. Great project, got lost uh, in, on the floor of discussion, unfortunately. But there are a bunch of other very interesting uh, uh, projects that they are going on. There are many identity platform, people that is coming with great idea. What he was mentioning was this guy, or this guy, as I said, that I, I like them particularly. They are doing a very interesting project. Uh, however, I do not agree with the kind of blockchain that they are using, but for the moment is the best that we, in my opinion, that we have. I'm a big EOS fan, so I really think that the future of IT, particularly because of the size and the speed, EOS will be the future. Um, the one that is very relevant, and then I'm almost uh, done with my, my part, again, yes, to speak that long, is the economic identity. The economic identity, why the economic identity is so important? Well, guys, Think about how many times your economic identity is fundamental uh, in uh, to do everything, particularly here in America, to do something. It's, let's say that you need to buy a car, you need to buy a house, even an appliance, and you need some credit. Okay, that kind of information, the trust, that what you, your history, what you represent, uh, is, that is what we call the economic identity. Your footprint in the economic universe. That is, this is will be really, really important, particularly when we're going to move in a kind of more financial system, because that's going to happen. Banks, they're going to go. <laughs> Sorry for whoever thinks the bank is going to exist in a few years. That ain't going to happen, besides the central banks. And the economic identity would be the way that in the, in the blockchain we're going to say not only who we are, but what good, how much we are worth it. So, Victor, you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Instead of having a credit score, we, we can have a social score. Mm -hmm. I agree. Why, why only how good we are at pay? I think, think about it like in a tribal society that you have the whole community that will say, how good is this guy? Yeah. This guy, but making business is fantastic. You know, this is the same thing. We have the consensus that is gonna help for that. Uh, dignity through identity is, uh, is a particular concept that is being used by various companies, and like there, there is kind of a movement attached to that. It's, uh, it's really how to, to harness all these various elements attached to the individual identity. And um, this is how I'm, we are seeing this. This is how the Government Blockchain Association is seeing the evolution 
from the various silos of the local bank, the employer, the international NGOs, and how that instead was going to merge in the economic identity. Like all these elements that they follow the, the families, the family, the individuals. All this data that is stored in the blockchain is accessible everywhere in the world, and uh, uh, you know they they do not lose who they are. Particularly if uh, in this case, in the specific case of the uh, refugees, uh, this who we are, <laughs> and this is. Uh, uh, like uh, where you can get more information about the government uh, association. After that, let me switch to my friend Pravi, that he instead is going to talk about, we're going to move from identity to AI. OK. There is So wide for that. Yeah. <laughs> so Mario, go there and pick up uh, some glasses. Before the bar closes. Yeah, before the bar closes. Otherwise, <laughs> we're screwed. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Bro. Hey. Yeah. So, 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 you know what? The greatest thing about Miami is, you know, we're big enough to matter, especially in mindshare. But we're small enough that we all know each other. So, like, Lorenzo and I are part of several different like groups together. So he comes to. So it's like really easy to do this type of collaboration here in Miami, which would. Be much more difficult in other cities. So, so yeah. Thanks for uh, having us. So, Play. Yeah, Can you explain to people so they understand what you have here? Myself okay. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's pretty uh, interesting setup here. So this is it. So we have the VR camera here. This is like a hat, a hat camera. We changed up the heat sink. So I'm a filmmaker on the side. So I have a movie on Netflix and uh, I have a couple of VR zombie films. Um, and then we have the the ambisonic sound right here. Three D sound. Can you explain what it is? Nobody knows what it is. Ambiosonic sound. So, what's a VR sound? Yeah, so, like, you know, if you have a VR headset on, you turn your head. You basically, as you turn your head, the sound still stays there, right? So, the sound hits your ears at different rates. So, this has got like six, uh, six microphones on that. And if you put something into a Unity 3D, you can spatialize it. So, as you walk around, you know, you can actually walk around sound. That's a little bit more programmatic, but it's definitely like um, off topic. So I'm already out. <laughs> so just this is also active. The other little camera over there. Yeah, so that, that's basically. So these cameras are are overheat, so you know, just to fill in the gaps. So, so um, yeah, so we actually um, so we actually have a couple more speakers as well, and I'll introduce the concept. So so I'm a startup guy. You know, I'm, my main office is Silicon Valley. I do my filmmaking. LA, but you know, I grew up down here, went to UM, UF, so Miami is uh, okay. close, uh, yeah. close to my heart. Um, so we, we actually, it's a funny thing, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the most successful startups in the world that you think is as successful, they actually have a basis here in Miami. Like Jeff Bezos went to high school in Miami, I'm not sure if you guys know that. His stepdad is a Cuban, um, Cuban immigrant. Uh, I'll check go high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, Cheryl Sandberg, his dad's still a doctor in Fort Lauderdale. He's an ophthalmologist and CEO of Facebook. Facebook itself was originally incorporated here in Miami. The co-founder went to Bellevue Prep. So I can go on and on. So, but we have, like, as part of that thing, we have something called the Miami Mafia. The people from Miami are in LA, San Francisco. Not just techies, but we all try to help each other. So, you know, we actually, you know, it's pretty good. You know. So some people have the MIT alumni association. We have the Miami based city thing. So. so let me dive in. So basically, well, a lot of us here, several group of groups that I see the Miami Data Science Study Group here. We have the EOS Miami Crowd and the Government Washington Association. So, and how they all fit together, um, the topic we'll talk about is, is identity management with facial recognition. So we have to, like, you know, these are such large topics, we have to, like, pick at least one silo. You know, and through that silo, we can touch on different topics. It's how people do like hello world, right? So if you do one compiled hello world, you kind of like to, to get to that point, you hit upon a lot of the major topics. So, so like I've, we went over blockchain, and so AI, what is that, right? So the AI aspect is you're basically guessing at reality. You're taking the probabilistic view of reality. 
while blockchain is deterministic, right? You, blockchain records the past or records the present, while AI is predicting the future. So the intersection of those two technologies is creating some emergent behavior, things that aren't available with just AI or just blockchain. It's basically creating a whole new ecosystem. So you know, the first startups that are kind of like getting funded or doing ICOs, you know, they're kind of like the typical marketplaces. So if you're a data scientist, you can basically, you know, in the past you basically had to write an academic paper or you open source your research. And you couldn't make a living off it. So basically, you know, you lived off your professor's salary or whatever. But now people are actually doing ICOs and actually selling their, their AI algorithm via utility tokens. So the first company that did an ICO on that is a Singularity. So they did a $34 million ICO. They basically it's a marketplace to sell your AI algorithms. The next, um, so basically there, there, there's an ecosystem, but they're all kind of like very basic and they're, they're either just, they're using like blockchain as typical like, you know, transfer of value. They're not really doing anything like advanced with smart contracts or doing anything algorithm. So we'll talk about more of that here, but one use case just for the hello world aspect about what facial recognition and identity is. So obviously facial recognition is a, a really cool use case for AI, right? But how do you put that and combine that with blockchain? So one company in Miami has a cool use case called Kairos. And what they're doing is they have uh, an API to your own facial recognition and they've trained the models. But what they're doing is they're using your face to unlock your hardware wallet, right? So basically their use case is you, know, you, you can't be hacked unless you have the biometrics actually unlock the wallet. Um, they have a lot of other use cases. That's one right there. Um, as far as like some of the other things that we can go go beyond it, as time permitting, beyond just the marketplace or just facial recognition, is you know what happens in a smart contract. Right? Smart contract is it's trying to do things, but it needs data from the real world. And how do you get that data? Basically, get the data from the world. So if, if you guys have ever made a smart contract, you know the, the big pain point right now is is getting data onto the blockchain, multi blockchain. So in Oracle right now, one single motorized call costs fifteen dollars. That's not sustainable. Let alone people are talking about complaining about gas or anything else, right? Let alone the data is actually a lot more than that. So one single call, having a human look at that data, to see is actually verified like your Yahoo Sports fantasy football you know, thing was legit. That's what, if, you, if you don't want to verify, it still costs thirty cents, right? So oracles can be used as an AI to determine, probabilistically, predict that some data is accurate or can be, can fill in the blanks. So you can get on data, blockchains on data as built into your smart contract. And that's definitely not possible without AI. So there's just some of the few use cases. So I'll stop right here right now, so I'll let the last speaker go on. And then as we have questions, I'll get back on and we'll answer those questions specifically. We have a lot of time, but I want to, you know, a lot of people here from many different groups, I don't want to like just, uh, Take all time. So this is Marcus. Hi guys. So uh, Mark Marcus is one of the top biometric programmers in South Florida. He came all the way and Tris came all the way from Jupiter today for the first time. She hasn't been in Miami in 20 years, so it's just for this, yeah. yeah, just for this. So we're gonna well, welcome them. And uh, so Marcus has worked on a lot of cool things with biometrics beyond facial recognition, but even iris scanning and looking at the blood vessels and everything. So I'll let Marcus take the floor. Okay, um, unfortunately, Lorenzo took a lot of my thumb. So thank you, it was really awesome, but you know, I, I, it's very much narrowed down what I have to talk about. Um, but, you know, I, I always like to start, when I, when I look at any kind of computer solution, I always start from the human factor itself, right? So, and when it comes to identity, I gotta say, we've been doing identity management since the beginning of time, right? We constantly do it. We, look at the people around us and we, we, we start building these biometric you know, mat uh, matrices in our head about how people change because you know if you look at the picture that's on my knee from 10 years ago it does look almost nothing like you know, I changed a lot in the last 10 years to the point where I, when I got pulled over the cop asked me to take off my glasses and he really looked at me like are you sure this is you and he really doubted it but Yet, as human beings, normally, we, when, as we progress, we do that all the time. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is when it comes to AI, you almost have to think in the same way, right? You know, AI is basically going to replace the human interaction that you are doing. So um, 
what we what I've worked with and what I've, I've seen working out there uh, in terms of AI is basically just how do you progress over time and what can you determine from the small pieces of information that you get? Um, you know, as as human beings, we don't we don't use our eyes very efficiently. We actually just go by little pieces of information, we kind of piece it together, and that's how we determine that something is what it is. Um, the same way, uh, you can actually use AI to, for instance, do a lot of forensics, and this is where I kind of see the coolest application of it. Um, imagine this, you have a picture of a person that has a, basically is totally masked except this little small area. Is it possible to determine the identity of this person just based on that little piece of information that you have right there? This is a real life application that actually happened. Uh, there is a group in the Carnegie Mellon uh, University that was able to identify a jihad um, warrior that beheaded somebody based on just this. They actually found him in Great Britain. Um, did whatever he did, went back home, and got nabbed because they actually were able to reconstruct his entire face using AI. And that's kind of where I think um, you know, facial recognition and AI really is coming in and it's, it's power play. So, uh, that's kind of all I have. Honestly. So Mark, so can you talk about your actual, your day job? Yeah, now at this point, I'm actually more in data protection. Um, I work for a pharmaceutical company, so I'm dealing with uh, a lot of, uh, I have to constantly think about how am I going to keep um, patient data protected, safe, that we can't, you know, somehow leak it out. And I, in that sense, I'm very much interested in, in, uh, in the blockchain. Um, as Lorenzo was mentioning, you can put all your medical records on, you can kind of lock it up or unlock it as needed to provide uh, that data to whoever needs to consume it in the medic as a medical provider. And, and you know, being able to pass on your very sensitive medical information securely is really like the ultimate goal that I have to deal with like, on a daily basis. Yeah, so, so Marcus works for a publicly traded NASDAQ company in Palm Beach. And then in your previous job at Cross, Crossmatch? Cross yeah. yeah, I worked at Crossmatch. Uh, uh, Crossmatch is a fingerprint kind of biometric company that's actually, they started with fingerprint, they went into ocular scanners. Um, that was, and then we also ventured into uh, background checking. It's another form of identity management where you have to really kind of, you know, trying to unearth anything that somebody's trying to hide. It's kind of like the opposite of blockchain, right? It's, uh, when you, uh, whether you do it through forensics uh, or, or for forensics or whether you do it for just, you know, background check for job applications, for instance, you really want to be able to unearth, you know, what this person did. And in order to identify that you really have the right person, you have to collect enough information so that you don't accidentally get the background information from somebody else. Um, you know, and so fingerprint scanning, sometimes actually uh, taking uh, image, images of the retina was part of that, and then collecting just basic uh, demographic information. Um, and uh, I, I always thought, you know, when I was working there, that one of the interesting factors about scanners is, is that, um, we, you know, of course we sold to government agencies, and, and, and one of the requirements was is that a lot of times, for instance, for fingerprints, you have to make sure that there isn't just about the fingerprints, it's also about the fact that there must be still a pulse in it. <laughs> they didn't cut it off. Yeah. Uh, another thing is, is like ocular scanners, um, you have to make sure there is actually blood flowing through the retina because someone could gouge an eye out and just use it as, as an entry method, right? So I, I, I thought that was kind of the dark side of it's like James Bondy. Uh, but it's, it's a serious concern that you have to keep in mind. Even facial Sounds like the GI when the guy's chopping off the head. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, um, another uh, factor is like for facial recognition, and this is maybe something you have to think about. I mean, I'm by no chance, you know, stretch of the imagination and an AI or blockchain expert, but it's something you have to think about. You can kill somebody and just drag their whole entire body up to a facial recognition scanner and still get in, right? 
So you have to maybe also figure out how you can See, find signs of life. So how can you figure out that there is blood in the finger and they didn't chop off the finger and the body temperature and there is a pulse and yeah, you, know, you know that that little clip that you get at the hospital? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. And there is there's blood vessels in in your uh, retina that 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 move in that yeah. in life. So, You're yeah. so <laughs> that that was really kind of like uh, the interesting part. And then um, you know I, I really love uh, Carnegie Mellon for some reason. I have like, affinity with them and, I, and um, another really cool thing that they were showing was uh, a, a retinal scan Canon camera so it's basically an infrared camera that they could set up they set it up uh, on the Pittsburgh airport in several spots where um, the moment somebody walked off the plane retinal scan happens it's a, it's a picture that's getting taken and then as they're walking through the airport the different cameras pick up basically can track from a very far distance your retina, so you can basically track a person coming off the plane that you could see it in the manifest, for instance, oh yeah, this person is suspicious, okay, we're gonna track where they're going. They're walking into the into the bathroom, they're coming back out, are they still, you know, are we sure this is the right person? Yes, it's the right person, because we still have the same retinal scan, and they can basically track them all the way out into the street. Now, that could be an interesting application for the future, if that you know, shows up everywhere, you basically walking around, it's no longer about Camera, like having normal cameras everywhere, you basically just constantly being scanned. You know, your eyes being constantly scanned. I thought that was pretty kind of it's creepy, it's creepy, but it's kind of cool. That's cool. <laughs> great. So, it's so like, where's your privacy then? You don't have yeah, any. yeah. So, I, I think we can uh, inch, so I think we yeah, can go around the room. That was a concern because yeah. they had to like work through that. So, they, they actually uh, found a way to scan even through sunglasses because a lot of people start wearing sunglasses. Sure. Yeah. So I think this is supposed to be a round table so we'll go around the room introduce ourselves and our projects but just before I go that so basically always if you guys ever been to an EOS Miami event before we always have some special like you know one more thing Steve Jobsy thing. So our one more thing tonight is we're announcing the formation of the AI Blockchain Alliance. So our first event or our first project is we're doing a global AI conference uh, using the Crowdcast app. So it's basically a virtual conference, but we'll have keynote speakers from, from Google, including a Vint Cerf, the inventor of the internet, and also our, the main thing is to be a pitch to Google event. So Google actually has a new AI venture capital arm called Gradient Ventures. So we'll actually have, um, oh actually, we have a guest who's, uh, okay, so basically, so basically, so people are gonna be applying to pitch from around the world, but if you're in Miami, or you're based in Miami, or Miami Heart, you're automatically in. You have a, mm -hmm. a, an idea to pitch to Google. So it'll be hyper competitive except for you What's guys. It so it's our AI, we're, we're actually modeling after you guys, right? Your Government Blockchain Association, the AI Blockchain Association. So um, yeah, so basically you know, we're trying to make it a thing. So the, the main concept is the intersection of AI and blockchain, so. So when are you doing this? It'll be, you know, later this year. So it's like an online conference, so we'll be speaking on the world. You have it day. Yeah, basically we're doing it right now with the FAU Robotics Lab. And so we're like, if you want to do it in person, you can do it, you know, FAU. at the FAU. Yeah. Can you post, could you post it on the meetup of the today's meetup? Uh, yeah, sure. Post yeah. A link on that. So I just, just want to introduce some guests. So we have the Miami Data Science Study Group here. So you guys want to introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Mash here. Uh, we have a conference coming up in January called Pi Data. Uh, and we just got secured Pi today. Pi PY. PI. PY yeah. data. And the PY is short for Python. Oh, yeah. So if you if you use machine learning, you're using one of two languages, Python and R. Um, some people are very canonical. They like one over the other. But honestly, just learn both. Uh, your life will be a lot easier and happier for it. But well, we've got NVIDIA. NVIDIA, of course, makes all the GPU, the graphical processing units that enable us to do the rapid, fast computations that make it possible to really have AI. Oh, can, you, can, you, can you introduce the concept of like data science from a Miami perspective? Like it's huge down here. Even if you've actually another, there's another data science meetup going on right now with like 100 RCPs. It's like a really big thing in Miami. Yeah, well, like why is it so big down here? Yeah. University, there's another conference that pay IBM and they teach you the IBM stack. Yeah, these dudes uh, just graduated from that. 
So if you don't if you don't mind, maybe we can post these events that are happening on the meetup. Sure. Uh, did anybody, uh, uh, if you guys could go to GBA MI, GBA MIA on meetup.com and you RSVP, then you can get the the post out. You know, anybody can go in. And, and, and yeah. So we'll, 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 we hope that this Pi Data Conference in January is going to be very big. It's a um, physical conference. conference. It is a physical conference here at the CIC. Oh, yeah. um, and just to give you a little heads up, I am talking to the mayor's office and all the economic development organizations, Knight Foundation, Beacon Council, and so on right now, uh, trying to get their support. They're not going to, they can't really sponsor us, but we're fine. We're getting funding from NVIDIA, Intel, and various folks. Um, but this, I want to get the mayor involved because the group that did the Amazon pitch, uh, bring them here at the conference so that they can talk about technology in South Florida. So take it really to the nth degree. And so a couple of little facts. Uh, can, can we, just to keep the session on track, we have 20 minutes. Uh, I want to, uh, let's follow back up because we're yeah. going to wrap up here. Um, I want to keep it on identity management and AI. Uh, so Alessandro was working on the biometric uh, techno uh, technology for uh, for uh, uh, voice recognition. Maybe we talk about Fortress yep. and how they're how the technology that they're using and how they're using it. Right? Okay. So my name is Alessandro. We started a voice biometric company because I got hacked at Chicago International Airport, and I decided after that hacking and two weeks of resetting all my passwords with my fancy algorithm, it had to be a better way. Uh, we went around to MIT, to Israel, to Russia, to a bunch of places to figure out what is the next big thing in biometrics and facial was just starting to come out at that time. And we looked around at voice and voice was in banking and IVR and it was really up here and it wasn't down here on the mobile space. So we decided that there was a space for us in the mobile space. Uh, fast forward three years, we created a voice biometric uh, that is now going to be portable. It's going to be available on the blockchain. It's going to be available to be distributed. Uh, it's also something that we felt, you know, kind of to your story, we've been identifying people with biometrics since the beginning of time, but in the 1800s, we started giving them ID cards. So what is that? That's metadata, right? So the ID card's metadata, financial data's metadata, it's all these things that we attach to what we know of as a person, right? Uh, so we think that uh, not only voice biometrics, but now we've incorporated a passive or behavioral biometrics into our solution, and we feel that the combination of those two things it's not only immutable, but it's unhackable, right? It's impossible because if they steal your voice brand, you just ask them something different. If they steal your passive behavior, you just ask them to do a different behavior. So when you look at facial, when you look at fingerprint, and you look at what we call static identities, they can be stolen, they can be spoofed. I mean, you have to be targeted. It's not something that happens every day. But if you look at voice, there's a couple of advantages that what we feel is number one is ease of use, right? So we're used to talking, and now with all these AIs and chatbots, we talk to computers all day long. We don't feel as much threatened as giving up our voice as we do as giving up our fingerprint or our retina or our iris because we feel that that's more criminal and governmental. More invasive uh, too. Yeah, more invasive. And hardware is the issue. You know, from a programming perspective, hardware is very intensive. So all I need is a pretty crappy phone microphone to do my voice by metrics, right? And with that, we can measure lots of things like facial sentiment and all these other things. And, and we did an experiment with IBM Watson that was really funny because we had a POC with a bank in Brazil to be able to walk up in an ATM and, and determine stress, you know, as I want to talk to my ATM and get money. Well, the problem is the same stress was measured, me pissed at my wife, or me actually being under stress with a gun. <laughs> IBM <laughs> couldn't tell the difference, right? So it's still you know, had issues, right? So we're not there yet. They take the gun. <laughs> <laughs> they they returned the same result, right? So we weren't. They found out the wife was more stressful. <laughs> right? And then, uh, you know, then we were asked to come to a conference actually just last week in New York at Finnovate, and they said, well, you got to do a seven minute speech. And I said, well, our demo is three seconds, so I don't know what I'm going to do for six and a half minutes, but I always take the opportunity in the morning to pick apart AI and chatbots and engines and kind of find their flaws, and I, I picked on Bank of America, which unfortunately they were there at the conference and they came to my booth afterwards, not very happy. So I got onto their, you know, I got onto their app and I turned on the virtual assistant and I'm logged into my banking sessions and I said, Erica, you know, hi, you know, who am I? And she says, well, I can help you with anything. And I said, well, you didn't answer my question, so obviously you can't help me with anything. I said, what is my identity? And she's like, well, I don't really know that. I said, well, who am I? And she said, I can't help you with any of that information. I said, well, I just logged into the session. You're supposed to know that it's me already because I'm in the session, but as artificially intelligent as you are, 
we still have a long ways to go to really understand the human being and, and actually interact with the human from an AI and chatbot perspective. So our kind of mantra is we are actually working with the UN, so kind of the project, I'll be in Geneva next week, we're going to Africa the week after, to understand how we identify people without being intrusive, number one and how to make them secure that their identity still stays with them, right? It's not on some national database or not criminalized and things like that. So we're gonna to try to figure out if we can do that with voice because one of the problems is where do you store that voice, right? So we're part of a big group out of the UK called the Sovereign Foundation is to come up with something called the Sovereign Identity, right? So let's keep our identity to ourselves and we give a banking or an entity or government one one hundredth of that algorithm so we can just match when we need to transact. So that feels a lot safer question. I uh, work a lot with Drummond Reed for many years. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have been working, I have been the board of director of XDI. Yeah, okay. That's where. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that we work in, like, for, like we were speaking for 15 years, in something uh, you talk it a little bit, uh, and it's basically that you talk is where do you keep the data? Okay, and you talk a little bit about that. So basically, uh, our vision, as most as possible, is that everyone keep his data, yeah. and you don't keep it in any place centralized. So I would like to, if possible, if you can speak a little bit about this, and also you, because yeah. I got the sense of both of you that it's still too much centralized. Yeah. But oh. you, you, you have <laughs> not, spe you have not spoken too much about it. You just yeah. very fast. But if you can speak like one minute just about this subject, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I have a quick one. So we're, our solution is, you know, we're going to right now start with keeping the data on the mobile, right? So the mobile is now your identity. It's exactly. your transacting device. Exactly. It's your identity device. You pay and tap now. Exactly. You're going to be able to pay and ID yourself now. So exactly. that doesn't serve everybody, right? So it doesn't serve the people in Ethiopia. It doesn't serve the people in many other places. We're starting with this solution, and then we have to expand that into how do we bring it out on the blockchain? Because at the end of the day, a blockchain is still a database, regardless of whether you distribute the ledger or whether you put it in several different nodes. There is a chance of breakage on the node. There is a chance of the nodes not talking to each other. Well, there is compromising. It's immutable. It's great. I don't think it's solved yet, and that's our perspective on it. But we do feel, and we're looking at, how do we put our bits and pieces of voice on the blockchain? So, so you're going to that way because the blockchain, even if it's encrypted, right? You know, yeah. Well, and that's no. right. So yeah, so. yeah, we're launching a solution to solve the actual certificate that's stored in the node because that's compromisable, right? So instead of actually doing identity with a certificate on the actual computer, we'll do it on the cloud, but we'll leave it as an, an identification. We're an identification SaaS service. We're an identification as a service, basically. And if we can determine where that service needs to reside, then that's the trick, right? So who it resides? Is it, a, is it a distribution of nodes that resides, potentially? Um, our problem is we can't actually transact and, and recognize a voice by keeping bits of voices all around because computationally it wouldn't be fast enough for us. You know, we do it in two seconds today. But How many characters do you need if I'm saying my name? Is that long enough? How much do I need to talk until you can recognize me? Great question. And, and actually, we got our answer from the Phoenicians. And actually, that Epcot ball, when you go in the beginning, you know, they talk about the Phoenicians. So we did ours as numeric. We don't use vowels. We don't use anything. So numeric made us international right away and in any language that we wanted. So you record a, a digit of 10 numbers. So it's almost like a token and a code. right? And we give you 10 different numbers to read every time. And we tie it to the session. And we tie it to your so we did a numeric. We so every decided. time I log into the computer, I have to read 10 digits? Yeah, we display the 10 digits for you to read. Yeah, so it's always different, you know? And so now we're doing it with door card readers. Uh, we're doing it with the Department of Homes and Homeland Security for first responders, right? So a great use case, right? They come with masks and gloves. They can't do a retinal scan. They can't do a facial. They have to talk, because that's their only means. So there's great use cases. You know, I think that all the biometrics have their use cases which work better. Um, I think ours has a unique characteristic for two reasons. People aren't threatened by it. Uh, we actually now have kind of reformed ourselves in a customer experience company because that's what we are. We want to make the customer not get pissed off that they have to answer challenge questions and do all the things that they hate to do about their identity. So ultimately, that's what Biometrics provides is a better user experience, and then from there, you lead to a more higher calling, which is a global identity provider. So, what are your challenges? Um, so, you know, from a voice perspective, loud noise, you know, you lose your voice completely, that's obviously the biggest challenge. And that's why we incorporated passive or behavioral biometrics. So the behavioral 
lot of our big consultants say that that's the future, right? That really the patterning of a user and the way that they do things really makes it zero footprint for them because they're not doing anything, they're just being themselves. They don't even have to talk, speak, look at the camera, nothing. Right? What are you measuring when you say behavioral? So we measure the way that you're tapping and typing on your phone, the way you're holding your phone. There's a hundred different metrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're all happening real time while you're on your phone. So okay. if you allow us to do it at all times, then it's actually much better. But if you do it in whatever session of the app that you're in, that's a little shorter. But it's two things that's really nice about that. It's on device, so it's you. Nobody else has it, right? So it's actually identifying you. It's all happening on the processor of the phone. And then we use the voice biometric as a step up authentication for next level authentication where you want to identify. Okay. So what do you do if you lose the phone? How do you uh, transfer you'll have over? To, yeah, you'll have to basically get your new phone and we, we re-register your voice print. Because you know, right now our voice print is SaaS, it's on the cloud somewhere. Okay. Right? So, uh, but the behavioral is just turning on the phone, re-registering the phone, and just go, going through the motion. We don't have to kind of reset it up, unfortunately. Without, without Well, that's a great question. So we started with vowel recognition like Nuance and all the big companies do, and we actually are patenting our own solution, which is uh, endpoint detection, which is exactly what you're saying. So our new patents that came out this month are based on stop and start of a voice rather than vowels because we have you know, 150 languages. It would be very hard to do vowels. Um, so we figure, and it also makes it mobile because the processing of a big multi-language database is huge. Um, start and stop really makes it able to run on the processor of a phone, which leads to the identity being on the phone. It is a business method pattern? I'm sorry? It is a business method pattern? Business method? No, it's basically a combination of two types of uh, recognition, which is... Oh, yeah. so asking pat about the uh -huh. pattern. Your is a business method pattern? It's a business pat method pattern, pat correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. What kind of a goal for the United Nations What kind of goal? So in Geneva, we're doing it for access to the Grand Palace because right now they came up with a whole new identity system that everybody hates, which is a combination of the card and a facial biometric that they were trying out. Uh, and in the UN, it was actually to do it with the voice recognition for people that don't have any devices. So it's just a, kind of the same thing that they were doing with the facial, which is a little bit harder because of conditions and different things that would go on where they felt the voice might be. So it's a proof of concept. How do you deal with the change of voice? Another great question. So there's two times in your life that you're going to have a change in voice is puberty and 60s. Oh. So in puberty, obviously, you have a voice change because you have one. And alcohol. Yeah, and, and no, no alcohol. But in your, in your 60s, so it's actually very interesting. In your 60s, you shrink, right? So as you get older, your body gets smaller, and your physical characteristics of your throat change, OK? So there's other instances where you'll have a problem. So I, I had a big event on a Monday. On Friday, I got my wisdom teeth taken out. So I get to my event on Monday, I'm supposed to be on stage, and I try to do my print, nothing was working, I'm calling my car I'm going to kill you. And he says, well, you have to re-register your voice, you got all your wisdom teeth taken out. As soon as I re-registered, it wasn't a problem. So it's physical characteristics of sound waves, which is pitch and cadence coming out of your mouth that we're measuring. And it was a great proof of concept. Like races, so. things like that would also Actually, happen. yeah, when I got Invisalign, I had to redo it again. Okay, because yeah. <laughs> I have that too. Yes. Um, I think it would be interesting to think about health for instance, my cousin, they diagnosed his Parkinson's because he had a very low voice. He had a soft voice. And all the time he went to, he tried to improve. He thought he needed the ENT <laughs> because, uh, you know, ear, nose, throat, because yep. he thought about his voice. Yep. And then they found out Parkinson's. So it'd be interesting almost those voice changes yep. Yep. that Good you could determine. do predictions. So IBM Watson does a little bit of that right now. Um, what we had a challenge with is, again, the AI that's out there for voice right now is that every, every human is so unique that you can't pattern it against other people because it's really hard right now and you just need massive amounts of data. Uh, the actual next solution that we're looking at is nerve impulses that go down to your hand. So you wear a Fitbit and you know your hand gets told to move and those nerve impulses have a pattern as well. So it's actually like a nerve identification. Do, they, do those also change with age and time? Or? Those change constantly, but they create a pattern. All these are simple algorithms that run and give you, you know, X, Y, Z and time pattern, and then from there. And where are you doing the development? So my partner is from India. We do it at Hyderabad at an IIT university, and that's where he's actually a professor. Uh, we partnered with some PhD professors there from Bridge Telecom, and we started building it all there. Uh, we actually, I designed the first one myself. So actually, I did my own first algorithm uh, in the shower, sort of. And, 
later. <laughs> I kept on thinking of the ways and things I had to do, and it was pretty good at the time when it started just going, but then we got some real people involved. So we took mine out. I was pretty sad. What kind of AI do you use? Neural network? Neural network. It's a deep neural network. Yeah. What so, kind of neural network? Like neural network sequence? Uh, so there you're going to start going over my, that'll be more of my CTO and PhD question, my data scientist question. So we use a deep neural network. We're doing what's called the GMM approach and an MFCC approach. So we're actually combining two different types of analyses. So, so no, that was it. Question? What problem is are there ever a circumstance where like two people have similar enough voices? That Great question. My wife's an identical twin. So I had the perfect case study at home, right? So she's an inch shorter though, so never match. So uh, people that impersonate your voice still won't work because they have a completely different measurement, you know, for pitch and cake. The only time it's ever gotten hacked at HSBC in an IVR scenario was after they tried to brute force it nine times. So if we cut it at three, so if you don't do it at three, you'll have to use the behavior. So you know, there's things that you can do. Also, they can't record your voice and play it back as we send them something different to say every time. So, you know, the, the ultimate goal of it is to really use what's called natural speech and to recognize whatever you say at any moment. But that requires right now a big server and a lot of data, and that'll never fit on a mobile. But right now, it has to be tokenized. It has to be a small uh, subset of data. How would it work if you want to do uh, uh, describe the blockchain? Uh, components that you're yep. talking about. Kind of like one of your slides that was up there. Uh, the metadata of that person can exist in all the different nodes of the blockchain. Uh, we were looking at distributing, actually, the you know we have 39 different kind of algorithmic uh, responses that need to can be stored potentially in the blockchain. But we wouldn't give you an identity back fast enough for people to really like it. And we do it in two seconds now on a database on SAS. But if we did it in the blockchain right now, we're up to a minute and a half, and it wouldn't be wouldn't be what someone would want to use. So. I think we're going to stick with the metadata of what it is that that identity provides for right now, and the identity just will reside with the user on the phone. Right? So that will be your key. Right? Say the same thing with the cryptographic key that exists on the node. We'll replace that with the identity server. And your immediate use cases that you're using that you're working on right now? Yep. So we're in three different market segments. We're in financial services, so we serve banks. We do it as a proof of con uh, proof of life, um, IVR customer call. You know, instead of the challenge question. A voice print. We do it in mobile banking transactions. So a lot of these mobile bankings are starting to be built on blockchain, but we're just providing our identity piece. Uh, we do it in healthcare. So we did it in a telemedicine application. Uh, this company here in Miami that's trying to sell their telemedicine app to uh, right now Aetna. And instead of you know reading a pin, which people had trouble with, you know they could just talk, and, and every time they got a prescription, uh, they could actually authenticate themselves with a sequence of numbers. Uh, and then in government, we just got part of a grant at the Department of Homeland Security to identify first responders uh, as they get to an accident scene. So, you know, there's a lot of grants as far as identity right now. And I was telling uh, Sylvia, the really strange one lately is we're getting a lot of interest from Japan. You know, we couldn't figure it out the last five conferences. They're like, come to Japan, you know, we'll give you everything and, you know, we'll let you set up shop and all this stuff. And finally, I asked the guy, you know, what's the deal? You know, why all this interest? And they said, well, the Olympics is coming up. And there's a huge identity security issue and getting in and out of the events and security and all that. And that's partly the driver. And they said the other thing, there's no real fintech community in Japan. In Japan, when they invent something, they just sell it to a big corporation and it's over. There's no medium in between where fintechs collaborate and the big fintech community. So they come a lot to San Francisco and to New York to try to get fintechs to come over there to kind of build some sort of community and get bought out or whatever the case may be. But so it's interesting markets. And India now we're launching next year as well because there the whole system's going cashless, right? So identity is a huge problem. Uh, there's a lot of impetus to, to provide identity solutions out there. Largest biometric experiment. In the yeah, world. that's right. That's right. Yeah. With all, all ID cards for 1.3 billion Indians yeah. are biometric. Yeah. 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 That's so four times the U.S. population. No, that's that's oh. live. That's that is absolutely live. I have my biometric ID card. Yeah. And it's not, because this is not new technology. You have it on you? Yeah. How does that, what does that work? How does that? I couldn't go into all of the exact specifics. It's, it's, it's mostly uh, iris scans. Yeah. yeah. Um, they did take my iris scan, so I do my face thing, fingerprint. Uh, they don't do blood. I have an ID card, but at least uh, gives you certain access. That does have blood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, uh, 
like you have to put your glove in the card every time you want to. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it just has you just slice your wrist. wrist. Um, the, uh, the, this is not entirely new. Um, is no. anyone here a veteran? Yeah. U.S. military? Okay. Uh, cat cards. Your cat card is biometric. So this is old technology. It's not quite veteran. Sorry? It's chip-based. It's not quite biometric. Well, it has certain, but the new one, they it's have biometric details, information chip. with it on the chip. And so if you're going to use any government-issued laptop, you're going to have to put that in, mm -hmm. or any location and so on. So in a sense, it is not, not, not the right, biometric like right. this, but they have that information. If you guys want to, who has Samsung phones? Who's ever done like the fish flop? Wow, all Apple in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, <sad. laughs> so when you go to set up the facial on your Samsung phone, I did this on stage, and unfortunately Samsung was there too, and they weren't very happy. But the first thing that it says is, you know, disclaimer: your phone could be unlocked by someone or someone that looks like you. So I go, this is a great setup. <laughs> so. All right. Any other thanks. So any other questions for Alessandro? We do uh, some of the round of applause. Yeah, so uh, just uh, we have just one more speaker, but then before we'll, I'll just introduce our next event for the AI Blockchain Association before our major global conference. We're going to do a uh, hands on workshop. So this is just the intro, but we'll actually do the hands on. It will be very, uh, very programmer friendly. But if you're not a programmer, we're doing kind of hello world ish type stuff. You'll figure it out. So we, we are uh, two meetups ago, we did a blockchain gamer conference. So basically now we're gonna extend that blockchain games to put that those blockchain games into a Magic Leap headset and put use the uh, Unity 3D uh, AI engine that's built in Unity 3D to do an AI game with Magic Leap on the blockchain. So it'll be uh, you know, that one day you're gonna like learn everything. So um, it'll be cool. So we'll post that. It's probably gonna be at the Magic Center uh, uh, at uh, Miami-Dade College. So we're gonna use their, uh, their new green screen motion control room. It'd be kind of cool. We'll like dress you up in the motion capture suit so you can be in the what game you yourself. Uh, it'll be, so I just got introduced to Mauricio just today okay. from Romy, so we'll, introduce, we'll figure that out. But like, you know, that, that, that's kind of like the sizzle. The real thing is we're gonna go into Unity 3D, how to do AI within Unity 3D for the Magic Leap in your SDK. So uh, it'll, be very, it'll be very much hands-on. So like we'll have some, some prerequisites of what the download, what software to download beforehand. So, you know, we've, we've do these, these, like, these workshops all the time, you know, usually React via other things too. So, you know, what works, what doesn't, but people even with no experience can be very competent at the end of three hours. So it's basically, we break it down into small steps. So you'll learn everything you need to know about these topics. So uh, just so the last person, Ivan, he's like our local Zuckerberg, like their future Zuckerberg. You know, like, you know my, my take is the number one thing about Zuckerberg is, you know, he dropped out, right? So Ivan dropped out of the UN. <laughs> so like, so, so he's, a, he's, already, he's already halfway there. I can't be Zuckerberg because I actually graduated from UM. You know, I didn't know. You know, if I knew, I would have dropped out like a day before graduation. <laughs> so he that'll dropped out. Our, you know, that'll be our motto at UM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can drop out. Yeah. And, uh, um... In fact, you know, like even even them, they're here a lot. Like Mark Zuckerberg's sister married a kid from my high school up in Broward, so like she, she's here all the time. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? Um, anyway, so so Ivan uh, has a really cool new job. He dropped out of UM for. He can introduce himself. <laughs> 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 professor here from UM. <laughs> no, no hard feelings. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 I started June last year, when I started UM a year ago, and um, I was doing software engineering at UM. And you were what? I was doing software engineering at UM. Wow. Prior to starting at Blue Beta, I did a mobile, native mobile app development for about two years, doing personal projects and uh, just little stuff I want to do for fun. And uh, I mean, I just learned programming through that and just doing those little projects. And um, I got the job at Blue Beta, and then I started at UM as a software engineer. And two semesters in. I wasn't really focusing at all. I was focusing on my work more than anything. So I decided, hey, I'm gonna think on, you know, just focus on work more, and then come back maybe when, if I want to do something different or, or something like that. Because I was already kind of ahead of the game in terms of what I was learning with software engineering at UM. That is. Um, so I uh, 
I started a online community for cryptocurrency and uh, smart contract developers online. It's called uh, Our Crypto Devs. It has a subreddit and a Discord server. If you guys know what Discord is, and um, on there, when I started that server, I met one of the team managers for IDEX. And IDEX is, if you guys don't know about IDEX, they're the leading decentralized Ethereum exchange. So if you go on any DAP radar period, you will see the number one DAP, IDEX. They're, they're completely phenomenal. Aren't they? They, they're a DEX, but they're a hybrid DEX, meaning that they keep the user funds on a smart contract, yet handle the order books and trade matching off the contract, off the blockchain. So that way it can still be a very fast acting uh, exchange, yet have the user funds safe in case of anything were to be compromised. So uh, I met the team manager in about May, I want to say this year, and uh, uh, we talked a lot. And and uh, when I started that dev community, he posted a job posting for IDEX, and I was like, are you serious, man? Like, is that really open? And he was like, yeah. So it took like, I think, a month and a half for me to finally get integrated. But yeah, so I've been there for a month now. I'm, I'm, Officially a junior engineer. I've been working with Solidity with their lead engineer, working on the contract with them. He's the only actually had only one Solidity engineer there. So I've actually taught him some things about Solidity which he didn't really know, and um, there's a lot of quirks to it. And a lot of gotchas too, but as a um, what, are you, what is your app doing? Talking human language so these people can yeah. understand. And what's Solidity? Solidity is the, sorry, <laughs> Solidity is the main smart contract language for Ethereum. So uh, it's about three years old now, I think. It has a lot of problems, but it also offers, it's, an, it's the first of its kind, really. So uh, there's, there, people are constantly improving it. There's a few languages based off, like, there's a few languages that have already improved off of the flaws of Solidity already. But Solidity is the first smart contract language and it's meant for Ethereum. So um, other platforms also use Solidity, even though they're not Ethereum. Like Hashgraph is one that's been really popular lately. Uh, we'll be using Solidity. Enigma is another one. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> what is your app doing that the human being can understand? It's <laughs> so, uh, not a programmer, it's not a AI. AI. <laughs> um, so, using Ethereum, right? So using smart contracts. Uh, there's a way that you can, a sort of escrow, that you can say, okay, hold my assets here. Wait until someone accepts that's at these assets for the price I want them for, and then send them both out, right? So that way, your mo your money is entrusted to the network, and people who are trying to hack it or whatever they can't get to it because it's trusted in that smart contract. It only says release it if this happens, and the moment that that matching happens, it releases it to the chain. Um, I don't know if you guys have used Ether Delta, but they're a much slower decentralized exchange because they do everything on chain, and that has its own downsides and upsides. But, um, so you're doing it off-chain and therefore you are faster? We do the order matching option, which is what is the main speed about. So you, you deposit your funds into the smart contract, it says, okay, you own this much, and then when you, do a, when you want to do a trade, you sign the trade you want to take with your private key, and then our order book assigns your trade to that key, and when someone else wants to take that order, for example, they sign that order that you put, and then it matches both of them, and then makes a transaction to the chain, and modifies the balances on the smart contracts, so that it can say, okay, you bought this, or you sold that, or whatever, for this much Ethereum, or so be it. Could you post a link of uh, what you're working on at, uh, on the meetup for today, too, sure. uh, so everybody can check it out? IDEX.market. Okay. Nice URL, I'll post it also as well. Yeah. Wait, do, do you know the, the token store? Excuse me? Uh, it's, it's a DEX. It's a DEX, yes. But it's a, it, it, Late is one of the latest. We're using the token store, so I just wanted to. Okay, to I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna send you a link. I, I already got you here on, oh, okay, okay. on Telegram, so I, I send you later. Okay, sure, sure. There's a, there's a, on the subject of AI. There's a Washington Elite AI Blockchain Summit that the GBA is gonna be hosting um, in. Uh, let me see, on November 30th to December 1st. Uh, John McAfee is going to be there, so if you have an interest in cybersecurity at all, uh, he's a confirmed speaker. Or if you want to party. Or if you want to party. Bring your guns. Yeah. Join the president of Air South America. In DC. Uh, so, uh, so that's happening. There's also a blockchain shift conference that's happening uh, next Thursday and Friday. Uh, we have a 40% discount code, so if you guys 
haven't registered or you're interested in going, uh, let me know, and uh, we'll share our uh, our, uh, our discount code with you so you guys can go ahead and attend. Uh, we're one of the sponsors for uh, for that conference. So, um, uh, time, our time is up here for the room. Uh, we could try to hang around a little bit uh, till we get kicked out, or we could try to migrate over to the hallway before Lisa comes up here and gets upset with us. this conference. If you have an EDU, UN EDU yes. email address, you can get the free, all the alumni can get the free pass to the conference. Blockchain shift? Yeah. Blockchain shift, uh, there is oh, a, no, it's $99. Soon. 99 dollars. However, yeah, there are some. They were distributed some free packs. You can so the EU address at all. I wanted to mention other two companies that are here that work with the blockchain. There is Signed here that is healthcare related. She has a lot of implication, Patty. She has a lot of implication with the ID management because the healthcare data will be placed on. The on the blockchain, and so there are going to be interaction in, because of HIPAA reason and uh, strong regulatory issues uh, with the healthcare information. It will be um, so there the whole uh, healthcare will be associated to an ID management system, and uh, will be everything will be stored on the blockchain. With that, there is also Preventor here. Preventor you know, is another company that is working at the HIMET. Represent is another company that works uh, with uh, ID management, uh, particularly in the area that I was talking about with with uh, economic ID. When we were talking about the economic ID, your economic profile will be stored uh, in, in the blockchain in this case. And he helps uh, companies that works uh, in the blockchain space uh, to monitor for anti-money laundering, terrorist financing, fraud, and all bad actions. With this, I think we are in out of time. Guys, it's been absolutely pleasure.